You're listening to The Drag. The Texas Department of Public Safety proclaimed it to be the number one uh, unsolved uh, murder mystery in Texas. So that gives it a certain status. She was just kind of a, just an average, a um, little bit of a tomboy, um, but um, just average girl, um, just like the rest of them. She uh, had a lot of friends, great sax player. Um, said she was, you know, involved in that and involved in the band. It was a Sunday morning in April of 1946. A group of high school girls were slowly beginning to drag themselves out of their sleeping bags as the sun made its way above the horizon. I don't know every detail about this slumber party, but I assume it wouldn't have been too different from the ones I've been to. They probably laughed with one another as they talked about their crushes. They probably did each other's hair and nails. It'd be no surprise if they barely slept at all, but by the time morning came, Something wasn't right. And it would only be a matter of time before everyone realized. One of their friends, a girl who was supposed to attend the slumber party, never showed up. They'd been worried the night before, wondering where Betty Jo Booker could possibly be. It wasn't like her to not show up. They went to bed hoping for the best. That maybe she'd arrive while they were all sleeping. That maybe her previous plans ran longer than expected. And she'd slip in undetected and join them all for breakfast the next morning. But Betty Jo was nowhere to be found. Across town, Betty Jo's mom was also worried. She usually stayed up until her teenage daughter came home, regardless of the hour. Betty Jo had been playing the saxophone in a Saturday night performance at the local Veterans and Foreign Wars Club, also known as the VFW. This place was the center of social events in Texarkana, and after Betty Jo's band performance, she had plans to go hang out with friends. Betty Jo's mom remembered her daughter saying she might go to a sleepover, so she stayed up as late as she could handle, until around 1 a.m. that Sunday before she decided to cut her daughter some slack. Maybe she just forgot to call home to update her mother on her plans. Betty Jo's mom decided to go to bed, but she jolted awake a few hours later with a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. She walked into the living room, noticing Betty Jo's saxophone was missing. It was odd. Betty Jo valued that expensive instrument. So, She always brought it home after a performance. Even if she had other plans, Betty Jo would never be so careless. Betty Jo's mother instantly knew something was wrong. She shook her husband awake. Betty Jo never came home, she said to him with urgency in her voice. Her sleepy husband, Betty Jo's stepfather, showed no sign of concern. You'll hear from her, he mumbled. But Betty Jo's mom knew that something still wasn't right. She stayed awake and she waited. I'm Peyton Sims, and this is season two of Devilish Deeds. Last episode, we talked about the victims of the first double murder, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. Their deaths happened only a month after another couple got attacked on a similar dirt road. But the first couple survived. Even though there had been two separate attacks on young couples, law enforcement didn't think the two were connected. But less than a month after the death of Richard and Polly Ann, the unknown killer was ready to strike again. 
In the spring of 1946, everyone at Texas High School in Texarkana knew 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker. She was only a junior. When she'd pass through the hallway, she was known to stop and talk to everybody. When Betty Jo was a toddler, she was crowned Miss Tiny Texarkana in a pageant. Her mom had a gold lame swimsuit made just for that. And on top of being a straight-A student, Betty Jo always set aside time for her extracurricular activities. Betty Jo played the saxophone in the school band. Sometimes, she'd pick up gigs at a local orchestra on the weekends. And somehow, she still found time to spend with her friends. For Betty Jo, this April weekend was just like any other. On Saturday, April 13th, Betty Jo was set to perform at the VFW. Dances at the VFW attracted folks of all ages on the weekends. The morning of, the spring air was finally beginning to warm up. So, she and a friend decided to spend the afternoon swimming at a nearby lake. Meanwhile, one of Betty Jo's childhood friends was eager to see her. 16-year-old Paul Martin had called Betty Jo the day before, wanting to hang out. Paul borrowed his brother's car that Friday after school to make the two-hour drive from Kilgore, Texas to Texarkana. Paul's family used to live in Texarkana, which is how he knew Betty Jo. He ended up relocating about 100 miles to Kilgore after his father died in 1940, when Paul was just 11 years old. Paul's family was friends with Betty Jo's family, and the two grew up together. Paul's parents weren't too fond of him driving two hours alone, since he was only 16. But they liked Betty Jo, so they let it slide. Paul was acutely aware of the fact that he and Betty Jo weren't kids anymore. He started to imagine what it would be like to be more than friends with Betty Jo. James Presley wrote in his book, The Phantom Killer, that Paul must not have realized how popular and busy Betty Jo actually was. But... Paul had big plans. When Paul had called Betty Jo to tell her he was coming to Texarkana, he was basically planning a date. Betty Jo, on the other hand, wasn't catching on. Presley writes that Betty Jo didn't realize that she was the main reason Paul was coming to Texarkana in the first place. Paul spent all day getting ready for what he thought was a date. He even washed the car he borrowed from his brother, wanting to put his best foot forward with Betty Jo. He even went by her house, but she was still at the lake swimming. He promised he'd call her later, and he did. Betty Jo was not exactly making her meetup with Paul a priority. When he called later, she said she'd have to rearrange her plans to see him, but she agreed that he could pick her up after her performance at the VFW that evening. He told her that he'd take her to a midnight showing at the Paramount. Betty Cho hesitated on the other line. The show would start before the VFW dance officially ended. Plus, she had already made plans with another guy that night. But since she was due for a visit with her longtime friend Paul, she called off her other date. I talked to Kelly Rowland, whose mom was friends with Betty Cho. The story she told me about how Betty Jo's decision to hang out with Paul went down is a little different than the version in Presley's book. They had had a sleepover at a friend's house, a bunch of other girls that ran around together. Um, and uh, Booker was going to play that night. Her mother called the girl's house where they were staying and told her that uh, Paul Martin and his parents were coming in that evening to visit. They had lived here previously and been neighbors Uh, with the bookers and um, they had moved away so they would come in to visit and so her mother told her that she would have to take Paul with her when she went to play that night and uh, mom said they got into a a little bit of an argument about it because she did not want him to go she didn't want to take him according to Kelly it wasn't just Paul Martin who came into town it was his parents too and Kelly's version of the story makes it sound like Betty Jo really didn't want to hang out with Paul at all, but she only did so to appease her mother. Since this case happened so long ago, it's difficult to know which version of the story is the truth. 
or if it's some kind of mashed up version of these two stories. However, Dr. Presley maintains that Paul Martin came to Texarkana alone, and that his mother worried over him driving that far on his own. What's clear in both retellings of the story, though, is that it doesn't seem like Betty Jo wanted to hang out with Paul. And she didn't really make her time with him in priority that weekend. Paul spent the evening before meeting up with Betty Jo with some friends. He waited and waited for Betty Jo to be done with her performance. <laughs> the night just couldn't come fast enough. It was dark outside by the time Betty Jo left her house to go and perform. With her saxophone in hand, she walked into the VFW club in a plaid skirt paired with a long coat since the temperature had dropped to the 40s. It was a cool April evening. Betty Jo was one of the four girls in the band of mostly men. Sometimes, their performances would go later than expected, and by the time they were done, the crowd would be full of drunk and rowdy men. Every weekend, a male band member would be assigned to safely escort all of the girls out to their cars to avoid any late-night drunken chaos. On this night, the crowd was especially large. The VFW's manager had promised to give away eight pairs of nylon hose to lucky women in the crowd. Plus, the VFW was a popular party spot. Like I mentioned in an earlier episode, Texarkana after the war was full of folks wanting to go out and have a good time. With people in the crowd mingling, dancing, and of course drinking, the band was in for a long night. They played from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. To close their performance, they ended with a soft and catchy melody of the song Good Night, Sweetheart. Then, everyone was signaled to head home. And as always, the girls were escorted out to the parking lot first. When Betty Jo walked outside, she felt the cool spring air hit her face. In the parking lot, Paul stood outside of his car. He'd been there the past hour waiting to see her. Paul had originally planned to take Betty Jo to a midnight movie, but it was way too late for that now. It was 1 a.m., but the night was still young for Betty Jo. She had plans to spend time with Paul, but she also wanted to make it to a sleepover at her friend's house. But before they did anything, Betty Jo insisted that she had to drop her saxophone off at home first. It was expensive, and she took good care of it. She didn't want to drive around her park knowing it was in the car. She dropped it off after every show. Paul agreed to swing by Betty Jo's house, under one condition. He wanted to take her to Spring Lake Park, just to talk and catch up. It was on the way to Betty Jo's house after all. It wouldn't take long. Then they could drop off the saxophone. Paul found a secluded area off a dirt road. He and Betty Jo were finally alone under the stars. And Paul likely thought his night couldn't get any better. But Betty Jo wasn't as thrilled. Sure, she was catching up with an old friend, but it was hard for her to relax knowing that her saxophone wasn't at home like usual. Plus, she had that slumber party on her mind. Their small talk was soon cut short. In the distance, they saw another vehicle slowly approaching them. It could just be another couple, but it wasn't. A tall man exited from the driver's side. He got closer, and they could see the pistol clenched in his hand. Around 6 a.m. the next morning, Sunday, April 14th, a family was heading out of town for a day trip. They decided to take a shortcut through the dirt roads of Spring Lake Park. It was still dark, but they could make out something on the road ahead. They could see it was a young man. He wasn't moving. The family didn't get out of their vehicle. They kept driving, then stopped at the closest home they could find. They asked to use their landline to alert police. Sheriff Bill Presley and another Texas side police chief were the first ones on the scene. Remember, these crimes were happening in Texarkana, which hugs the border of Texas and Arkansas. 
So law enforcement from both states got involved. Immediately, they knew the man was dead. The body lay on its side, curled up in a fetal position, wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants. When officers found his wallet, they ID'd him as 16-year-old Paul Martin. Here's James Presley, the nephew of Sheriff Bill Presley, and the expert on this case who wrote the Phantom Killer book. He'd been shot four times, and uh, it turned out they shot twice at two different times. He had bullet wounds in his right hand, his left shoulder, the back of his neck, and in his face. He'd been shot with a 32 caliber pistol, the same type of gun that murdered Polly Ann Moore and Richard Griffin. His borrowed Ford coupe, which still had the keys in the ignition, sat about a mile away from Paul's body. There was a puddle of blood across the road. Officers thought he might have tried to crawl away. Sheriff Presley scanned the area, and he noticed a small object on the ground, a date book belonging to Paul Martin. Without saying anything to the other officers, he picked it up and slipped it in his pocket. Remember, law enforcement didn't really handle evidence that well in this case. It wouldn't have been abnormal for him to put the date book in his pocket. But he continued searching. As they looked for any other clues or evidence, they found nothing. By this point, the police knew only what they saw that Paul Martin was dead. They had no knowledge of his night with Betty Jo or that she had even been with him. They didn't know to ask what you're all probably thinking. Where was Betty Jo? As the sun started to rise, so did the people of Texarkana, including the girls at the sleepover Betty Jo never showed up to. That's when they noticed she never made it. If Betty Jo made a plan, she almost never changed it. That's just how she was. So that's how they knew something was wrong. One of the girls at the sleepover decided to call one of the members of the band Betty Jo played with at the VFW the night before. Sherry Atkins often gave Betty Jo and other girls a ride home. It was 6 a.m. and she wanted to check with him before worrying Betty Jo's mother. Jerry woke up and answered the phone. The girl asked if he took Betty Jo home last night. He said that it wasn't his turn. A different guy from the band had escorted the girls out. So he went back to bed, only to be woken up again by the sound of ringing a couple hours later. It was one of the girls at the slumber party that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. She asked if he knew where Betty Jo went. He was annoyed at this point. He had no idea where Betty Jo had gone, and he didn't know why people kept coming to him for answers. The girl told him that Betty Jo was picked up by Paul Martin. He had never heard that name before, but he still didn't see what the problem was. Then she told him that a teenage boy was found shot to death at Spring Lake Park, and they're pretty sure it's Paul Martin. Jerry began to worry. He started making desperate phone calls, hoping to prove that Betty Jo hadn't been with Paul Martin. He called everyone he could think of who might have given Betty Jo a ride home that night, but none of them had. He finally called the other three girls in the band who confirmed that Betty Jo had gone with Paul. Jerry had to face the reality that Betty Jo might have been with Paul when he was killed, but where was she now? Once the police found out that Betty Jo was missing, they knew they needed help. Most Texarkanians were in church, so Sheriff Presley did the only thing he could think of. He drove to the church he attended and interrupted the service, explaining the situation. He needed their help. Without hesitation, people started spilling out of the chapel and into their cars, all heading to Spring Lake Park. Here's Dr. Presley again. And so then the search was on for Betty Jo Booker or her body. 
Community members from around town spent their Sunday morning trekking through the woods of Spring Lake Park. They were determined to find Betty Jo, and they wanted to find her alive. Two members of the search party chose to look around a community called Pleasant Grove, which is close to Spring Lake Park. They walked through the trees in the thick brush. That's when they saw her, a girl lying on her back. She looked peaceful, as if she were sleeping. Her hand rested on her chest, her eyes closed. But as the men got closer, they saw the bullet wound that pierced through her cheek, causing blood to drip down the right side of her face. She had another bullet wound in her chest that traveled straight through her heart. Her long coat was still finely buttoned, and her plaid skirt was laid out smoothly. After stumbling upon the scene, the men immediately alerted Sheriff Presley, and the dirt road was shut off. They were now standing at a crime scene. Word quickly spread throughout town. People panicked. There had now been two double murders. As they do in small towns, rumors flew. Everyone assumed Betty Jo had been raped, though lab results came back inconclusive. They did note that both double murders were committed with the same type of firearm. But once again, they had no suspects. The next day, on Monday, April 15th, the Texarkana Gazette's headline read, Teenage couple shot to death. While the town mourned, Betty Jo's friends were devastated, and they were also angry at the headline in the paper. Betty Jo and Paul were not a couple. Texas high school forensics teacher Kelly Rowland, whose mom was friends with Betty Jo, remembers how livid her mom would get about this. Her name was Mary Ann Hearn, and she was a very good friend of Betty Jo Booker's. The implication of the information that came out was that, that they were a couple and that, that they were in the park area uh, making out in the car. And, and any time that would come up, my mom would get very upset. And she said that absolutely 100% is not true. Uh, she did not like him. That would not happen. So that always kind of put a different angle on it because that's what everybody had assumed was that, that they were a couple and they were were there together and someone walked up on them. Um, and she, she was emphatic about that is not true. That would not have happened. During my research, I came across a Texarkana Gazette article. Reporter Bob Mandela interviewed Betty Jo's mother following her daughter's death. And the article brought tears to my eyes. Betty Jo's mom told the reporter that she believed her daughter's death was a sacrifice. It was a warning to other parents who might let their children roam free. While she flipped through old letters and childhood photos of her auburn-haired daughter, Betty Jo's mother stopped at a poem. She said that this poem has given her the most solace she's had. Somewhere back of the sunset, where the evening shadows fall, there is a heart that listens and only answers to my heart's call. Somewhere, kind hands are waiting, a face that is filled with love, looks at me very sweetly from a wonderful home above. Somewhere back of the sunset, a laugh rings out through the sky. Happiness lives there always, and a peace that will never die. Pain and distress and worry, grief and untold despair, they are passed by for the sunset sheds only a brightness there. Somewhere back of the colors that come at the end of the day, she lives in a land of flowers, and none of them fade away. And her fingers flash in the sunlight, and her lips are lovely with mirth, and her ears hear the prettiest music that is never heard on earth. Loveliness, wistfulness, longing. What does she know of them? Where the days are tinted with splendor and the nights are soft with love. Where dreams may be had for the asking and wishes always come true. Where the ground is as green as springtime and clouds are forever blue. Somewhere at the back of the sunset, the prayers that we breathe shall rise and rest like a kiss that is gentle 
on a pair of joy-filled eyes. Somewhere back of the sunset, when the evening shadows fall, there is a heart that listens and answers my own heart's call. I don't know who wrote that poem. Maybe you've heard it before. But Betty Jo's mom said that every time she reads those words, she can almost see Betty Jo's face. And she could almost hear her speak. Her mother said that if her daughter's killer was ever found, she'd like to kill him. And if they would let her, she would want to kill him herself. At Texas High School where Betty Jo attended, there was not only a wave of grief that swept over all of the students, but there was also a wave of fear of who could be next. Here's Dr. Presley again. And this was the thing that set the town in stitches of fear. Because then you had uh, two double murders that still hadn't connected the attack of uh, Paulus and Larry within three weeks apart. And that became a part of the fear. They said, well, is that this guy is striking every three weeks? Frank McLean attended Arkansas High School when news of the double murder broke. His memory of 1946 is fuzzy, but he still remembers Paul and Betty Jo. I knew them both, but not well. And Betty Jo went probably through grade school and maybe junior high or part of junior high with me, and then she transferred to Texas high school. And so I kind of lost her. I remember her playing the saxophone. And on Paul's, in Paul's case, I knew him, and then in high school, as best I recall, he had gone away to school somewhere. And I didn't know him, I don't remember him at the high school level, I remember him probably more at the junior high school level. As, as best I recall, Peyton, they were uh, well accepted by their peers, and and you know, whether you call that popular, whether you call it, uh, you know, they were just, just normal kids and well accepted to the best of my memory. Frank remembers how the high schoolers reacted after they learned of the murders. We were all conscious of darkness and roads and being alone and that kind of thing, you know, probably more so than we would have been otherwise. It had been played up in the papers and there was a lot of fear in the community the whole community was in shock as a result of those series of killings. To this day, Frank is one of the many people who still feels the shock of the phantom killer attacks. He now owns a really big dog named Sir. Frank claims that Sir is a good security system, which I'm sure he is, but he's also pretty cute. I have a big German Shepherd dog <laughs> to protect me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I have a gun in, in my bedroom where, where I could get to it, you know, if I needed to. One of the uh, security type salesmen, ADT and that kind of people, came to my door one day and he said, uh, do you have a security system? And I pointed to Sir, and I said, yes, there he is. And he said, I bet you have a gun too, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, thank you. Despite the outpouring of grief and fear in the community, Betty Jo and Paul's killer still hadn't been brought to justice. The victim's loved ones waited for any lead or suspect that could give them closure. So, there were now three unsolved attacks. Betty Jo and Paul's murders, along with the first double murder in March and the first attack in February. It didn't seem like they were making any progress. And according to Kelly, Law enforcement continued to take students out of school and interview them. So that school year had already been very traumatic for them. Um, they were very young, and that was, you know, the, the beginning of their school, high school career, and it traumatized them a great deal. But then during the investigative process, the Texas Rangers kept bringing them in. Uh, they would come to the school and get students and take them downtown and interview them for hours. Uh, and they were doing this day after day after day. 
uh, until finally the parents got together and told them that's enough. You know, you, you have what you're going to get from them and they need to go back to school. And I think that return to normalcy was the best thing for them to move forward. Um, but it was, it was a very traumatic year for them, for all of them. And in Kilgore, Texas, where Paul Martin was from, his family and friends were just as devastated. Paul was only three weeks away from his 17th birthday. I wish I could tell you more about Paul's life. In Presley's book, one of Paul's high school friends said he was a short boy with the best attitude you ever saw. I don't think he had an enemy in the world. Everybody loved him, and he just loved people. But I can tell you that Paul was a teenager who just wanted to spend time with a friend on a Saturday night, just like I did at 17. I do know that Paul was a person who didn't deserve to die. I've looked for photos of Paul during his teen years to have a better sense of who he was, but the only published photos of him seem to be from childhood. And as it reads on Paul's grave, those who knew Paul best loved him most. Reporting on this story, this murder is the one that really sticks with me. I attended Texas high school myself, where Betty Jo went, and one of my closest friends played the saxophone in the school band. During my junior year, I was stressing about school and boys just like Betty Jo was, and on the weekends just like her, I'd be driving around Texarkana with all of my friends. That's the thing about living here, <laughs> there's only so much to do. Today in Texarkana, my friends may go to Waffle House at 1 a.m. instead of the all-night cafes that were open in 1946. And the Paramount is now the Perot Theater, so there's no midnight showings for our friends to attend. But really, not too much has changed. There were times we'd even drive out and park on a dirt road, and our friend group would talk about life and stargaze, just like the victims in this case did. All of these victims were innocent and seemingly random people. Many of them were still kids, really. And that's what continues to strike me the most. Before her death, Betty Jo Booker could have had a big test she was studying for. Maybe there was a guy she had a crush on. If she made it to the sleepover, I'm sure she would have told her friends all about it. She was fixing to be a senior. Maybe she was already thinking about who her prom day would be or what her dress would look like. Maybe she already had dreams for after graduation. And I'm sure Paul would have been on the same page. Maybe he had plans for his birthday in May. Maybe he wanted to ask Betty Jo or some other girl out to his school dance. But now, we'll never know how these hopes or dreams would have turned out. The lives they would have grown into, if they would have been given the chance. Almost everything I found that relates to this case seemed to be so sensationalized. It was the 1940s after all, and the media fed off of the fact that this unidentified serial killer murdered innocent people. All but two were teenagers. Maybe this helps some people disconnect themselves from the trauma, but oftentimes, I think the world forgets that these victims were real people. Every October at Spring Lake Park, people bring their families and picnic blankets for an outdoor screening of one particular movie. The tradition began in 2003, Admittedly, I've been there a few times myself. The movie that is played is a 1976 horror movie called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The film was based on the true story of the Phantom Killer. My friends and I brought candy, shared snacks, and watched a scary movie just like any Friday night in a small Texas town. I remember the creepy feeling of being in the park at night, but the reality of these murders never really set in until I started this podcast. The only thing accurate about that, basically, was the title. Boy, was that title that got it exactly right, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Because a lot of the other parts that have been fictionalized and then, you know, reshaped the movie. The movie is directed by Charles B. Pierce, who directed 14 movies before The Town That Dreaded Sundown but none of them are that commercially successful. The only one you might have heard of other than the town that dreaded sundown is one called The Legend of Boggy Creek. Both of Pierce's most well-known movies have become pretty popular in cult film circles. Pierce was born in 1938 
and grew up in Arkansas not far from where the murders happened. Despite being from the area, Pierce didn't prioritize getting the facts straight in this film. The tagline for this movie reads that the killer, quote, still lurks the streets of Texarkana, Arkansas. And the movie claims that, quote, the incredible story you were about to see is true. Where it happened and how it happened. Only the names have been changed. But as the people of Texarkana know, much more has been changed than just the names. I've always had an interest in forensic science um, and hearing about this case. When the first movie was made, um, some people that worked for Charles B. Pierce contacted us uh, because mom had been involved and asked us if our family wanted to be in it as extras and be involved in it and could she be interviewed. And, and my mother didn't, didn't curse often. And that's the first time I've ever really heard her explode on the phone um, and, and curse loudly at someone and then slam the phone down. Um, and so I, it, it shocked me and it made me realize how passionate she still was about it and, and how fresh it was still in her mind. Families of the victims even tried to file lawsuits after the movie was released. Here's Ruth Mahoney, the niece of Richard Griffin who was one of the victims of the first double murder. The town that dreaded sundown, I remember it upset my grandmother horribly. And she even went to the point of consulting a lawyer because she thought it was disrespectful. I guess it drug up some bad memories for her of when he was killed. And he was the oldest son. And um, I think it just was... She didn't want all of that drug out. And apparently some of the portrayals that they were proposing were not correct. Ruth told me that Polly Ann Moore's brother tried to file lawsuits over the movie, too. She also remembers how the sensationalism of how her uncle's murder portrayed in the movie continued to impact her family years later. She said that after the movie came out, it made the case so much more popular. The trend launched a new investigation of the crime scenes. But Ruth said that her family just wanted to be left alone. And I remember when I was a small child, Texas Rangers would visit my mother and bring things and ask her, was this Uncle Richard's? Like one time, I think they had a wristwatch. And um, they weren't his as far as I know. But um, that was an impact. You know, I, I remember thinking what is this? Betty Jo's death in particular was dramatically sensationalized in the movie. Instead of playing a saxophone, the character of Betty Jo played the trombone. The writers of the movie decided that getting shot to death didn't have enough action. So they got creative. And when the phantom killer attacked her, he attached a knife to the end of the trombone and moved it forcefully back and forth into Betty Jo gruesomely stabbing her to death. Here's Dr. Pressey again. And it's a gripping scene, you know, they got trombone. And I started laughing. And these people turn around to see who that weirdo is. Well, the weirdo knew this didn't happen. It's a, it's a saxophone. And I talked to a lawyer years later, several years ago, telling about the guy who wrote the script, how he said, well, we can use a trombone. <laughs> So, so, you know, they took a lot of liberties, a little bit far. But that was another thing that added to the um, myth part of it, a legend. And I knew that that would uh, affect people's perception of what happens. The town began receiving national attention once more for the murders. This paralleled the news coverage the town received back in 1946, when word of the serial killer first began to hit national news. In June of 1946, Life magazine published a two-page photo story titled Texarkana Terrors. The story wrote that the town was, quote, tight in the grip of mass terror. The story also included a photograph of one Texarkana citizen who set up a booby trap at the front door of her house. She slept with a rifle next to her bed and set up a contraption of loose nails, tin trays, pots, and vases to wake her if an intruder entered. Around the time of the Life magazine story, 
editors at the Texarkana Gazette coined a term for the serial killer. That term became what the murderer would forever be known by. The Phantom Killer. But weeks after Betty Jo and Paul died, law enforcement still struggled with the investigation. The crime scene lacked almost any trace of the murderer. One officer noticed something stolen from Paul's Ford Coupe. Betty Jo's saxophone. Officers talked to local pawn stores and music stores. They hoped to find a serial number that matched Betty Jo's instrument. The search for the saxophone would continue for months. After Betty Jo and Paul's murders, Sheriff Presley knew they needed to reach out to the Texas Rangers again. The Texas Rangers came in, all the Company B came in with the colorful Lone Wolf Gonzalez. He said the people were panicked. I got this from his oral history statement he'd made later. And uh, he said he never had seen anything like it. Now, this man had seen a lot of stuff you know, all over Texas over a lot of time. He'd never seen anything like this. And that added to the glamour of this, if you might call it, of this case because you had the Texas Rangers. That Texas Ranger just mentioned, Captain Manuel Trezazas, Lone Wolf Gonzalez, certainly sounded colorful, according to Dr. Presley's book. Presley writes that the Lone Wolf rode into town on a decked out Arabian horse with pearl-handled pistols. And of course, he wore a white Stetson cowboy hat. Think Walker, Texas Ranger, but in the 1940s. Or the Lone Ranger, but a little more jazzed up. The editor of the Texarkana Gazette said that he was, quote, the best looking man I ever saw in my life. But when it came to the case, Lone Wolf didn't have much luck either. I once heard of the Texas Rangers, and there they were, they were out converging on Texarkana and they couldn't solve the case. They had all kinds of strategies to try to trap the killer. They'd have dummies set up and would, would one be a woman and a, be a real lawman there, like they were cuddling up lover's lanes. He didn't take the bite. What that did, it led to some uh, situations that were not funny at the time, but later, in retrospect, were funny. Lone Wolf even admitted to the newspaper editor that the killer was smarter than him. The killer never showed up for any of the traps he set. Despite the curfews and fears in the town, young people still went out together, and some found their own ways of protecting themselves. Tillman Johnson and Charlie Boyd, who was a state trooper, and, and Tillman was a chief deputy sheriff, they were riding around, and they came upon this car. There's a young man, young woman in it, Lover's Lane type. So Tillman got out, and Charlie was covering. He stayed in the car in this case something happened. And Tillman uh, goes up and there's this man and wo young man and wo young woman. He said, aren't you afraid to be out here with a killer loose? And she said, mister, you're the, one, you're the one who should be afraid. She had a pistol pointed at him and said, I was about to let you have it. I said, uh, if you hadn't told me who you were, and so, you know, Tillman said that it was a big mystery why some lawman wasn't shot during that time, just going up in cases like that. He probably came close to getting shot there if he hadn't you know, told her who he was. As the citizens of Texarkana went about their lives, law enforcement continued to search for any leads in the case. But Sheriff Presley had one piece of evidence he had been holding on to, something that only he knew about. Remember that small date book he found at the scene of Paul Martin's murder? Sheriff Presley picked it up from the bushes nearby. And that one small piece of evidence would soon link one of the most notorious suspects to this case. But law enforcement wouldn't be able to pin down a suspect before the killer struck again. 
next on season two of Devilish Deeds. And his wife heard a noise in the backyard. And she said, Virgil, turn down the radio. I think I hear something. And she never knew whether he heard her or not because of, shortly after that, the killer, he was sitting at the window with the curtain halfway up, shade halfway up, and he was shot in the back of the head twice. This season of Devilish Deeds was reported, produced, and hosted by me, Peyton Sims. The executive producer is Katie Pinkshikautka. Katie also did the editing and sound design for this podcast, with editing assistance from Sewa Oliveras. The associate producers are Jade Emerson, Aurora Berry, and Liv Gamble. I'd also like to thank Dr. James Presley for allowing me to reference his best-selling book, The Phantom Killer, throughout this podcast. Because of his diligent research, all five episodes of this season were possible. I'd like to say a special thanks to my boyfriend, Asad Malik, who you heard me mention in a couple episodes. He not only read over some of the first drafts of my scripts, but he also helped produce a promotional video. The Drag's marketing and communications manager, Sophia Vargas Karam. Alexa Georgellos designed the cover art, and I took the photo. The Drag is an audio production house within Texas Student Media at the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Special thanks to Robert Quigley, Rachel Davis Mercy, and Gerald Johnson. The Drag is a nonprofit educational program that gives students like me hands on audio storytelling experience. If you want to support our work and help us create podcasts like this one, visit thedragaudio.com slash donate.